Well, good morning, friends. Welcome to worship. Happy New Year. So thankful to be able to be on this new journey with you, this new season of life as we begin a new year and have this opportunity to do it uh, by studying God's Word together. There's a passage of Scripture I want to begin our service with today, and really kind of want this to be a theme uh, for our whole life going forward. It's Philippians 3. The Apostle Paul says, hey, he said, I- I've not fully yet arrived at all that God has in store for me, but, Philippians 3.13, he says, what I do is I forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead as I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Friends, our theme this morning and really for this whole sermon series that we're starting today is this concept that there are greater things to come. We're maybe in a transitional moment, a pivotal period of changing and things going on, but there are greater things to come. Do you believe that this morning? Because God has promised so. Let's stand this morning. Let's stand upon that truth today. Let's, let's worship the Lord for those promises that he's given us. Uh, let's glorify him in this moment together. We're so glad you're here today.
had so loved the world of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cry left 
left his throne to wake as a child. He became like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him. saints, healed blind, the lost and lame, even now he is in our midst, behold him, he who chose a criminal's end, paid with blood to settle our death, buried death as he rose to that we sing a part of our uh, daily life of reflection on you. And uh, I just thank you that we can call you Father. And thank you that you are the God in heaven, the one in control. And I pray that we would just uh, walk into this next year with that in mind. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Thank you guys for a powerful time of worship. And... Um, Thank all of you for being here today. Thank you to those of us joining on online, and we're excited to know that you're a part of uh, what's going on here this morning remotely. Um, I'm very excited about this journey that we're going to begin today, journey through the book of Joshua. 
you want to turn there, we'll begin by introducing um, the book this morning. Many of you have read Joshua probably multiple times. I uh, encourage you to do it again. I encourage you uh, over the next few weeks, read the book, soak it in. Uh, there's so much beautiful truth and historical value to the book of Joshua. But even more than that, it's a story of the living God who reigns over all history and shows us who he is, shows us his character, his nature, his promises, and his victory. So we're going to look at Joshua chapter 1, beginning in verse 1 this morning, go through verse 9. Um, really kind of an introductory sermon as we look at this journey. The title of this series that we're entering is called Moving Forward. It's very timely for me today, and I think it probably is for you as we've begun a new year, closed out a chapter, looking forward to the next season that the Lord has for us. Uh, it's a great time just to be reminded of his promises to be reminded of what we have to celebrate, to be reminded of what lay ahead in the future. So the book of Joshua teaches us about the character and nature of God, teaches us about his promises, how they always stand, how they will always be fulfilled. But more than that, the book of Joshua helps us understand what our response is to the promises of God. The book of Joshua is all about obedience, faithfulness, it's about mankind's response to the glory of God, to the grace and mercy of our Lord. So we're not only going to learn about ancient history, but also about the living God who rules all history for the purpose of accomplishing his divine plan of grace and glory. As we open the book of Joshua, we know there's a pivotal time of transition going on for the people of God, those of Israel. We're going to see today that a time of change can be a difficult time, but also a glorious time. A time of a new season beginning can be a wonderful, victorious season in life. So let's read the first nine verses together, and we'll say a few things. And as I said, we'll be on this for several weeks as we look at the, the beautiful truth that is contained in this book, the book of Joshua. Beginning in verse 1, it says, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. <coughs> no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. What powerful words. I hope you write those words on your mind and your heart and return to them frequently. I know that Joshua 1 has been impactful in my life. I trust that it has been in yours as well. And, and I believe with all my heart it's going to be very impactful as we go forward. Because the book of Joshua describes a journey. And we know that we're all on a journey, a journey of faith, a journey toward the promised land. That's where the, the nation of Israel is headed. They're going to the land for which God has promised. All the way back in Genesis 12, God promised Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will give you this land. Everywhere you can look will be yours. And so this is the journey of faith. So let's say a few things about what we see here that relates to us today. The first thing in this passage that I think just really stands out is the fact that seasons change. There's other ways to say it. Maybe you say chapters in, right? Maybe you talk about eras. One era closes, another one begins. 
We think about this in our life, and sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. There were components about the season that's changing for the nation of Israel that was good and some that were bad. Maybe in your life, you're closing a chapter that you're really thankful to see come to an end. Maybe you're closing a chapter that you're very sad about ending because it's been a good one. Maybe you're in between. But the truth is all of life is about seasons changing. It's about transitions. There's major changes, there's minor changes. The Bible describes a major change that we go through if we know the Lord, right? It's the change from being enslaved to sin to being free through faith in Christ. That's a major change. The most life-altering, destiny-defining change that we all go through is, is when we come to Christ and we are released from our bondage to sin and we are free to live a life of faith. The greatest change we all go through. But through life, we go through many other changes, right? Things come and go. People come into our life and leave. Jobs change. Locations move. In a spiritual sense, we go through small transitions every single day. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I die daily. Right? Meaning that every day is a chance to shy away from what would rob us of victory and to push into what God is doing. And so every day is a transition, really. It's a change to say, I'm no longer who I once was. Praise God, I'm heading to where he wants me to be. And so every day is a change in small ways. We have other changes, right? We have um, opportunities to see good things come and go, bad things come and go. We're all headed toward the most glorious transition, which is what Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 5 when he said we'll reach the point where we are away from the body and at home with the Lord. And the glorious final change of address, right? But in the meantime, seasons change. Everything is moving. The only thing that stays the same is the fact that everything is changing, right? And so how do we navigate change? How do we navigate transitions? Let's look at what's going on here in Joshua 1. This is a major change. I mean, up until this point, Moses was the guy. In fact, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, four books of the Bible leading up to Joshua are about God, but they're ultimately about Moses being the giant human leader that the people relied upon. The people saw his faithfulness. He, he saw God face to face and related his messages to the people. And, and so just think about how devastating it is for the book of Joshua to begin with this bold statement that Moses is dead. I mean, that was earth-shattering. The guy who had been the greatest human figure in all of history up to that point is gone. You talk about a chapter ending and a season changing. But what we see here is that God gets that out of the way first, right? Verse 1 is, okay, Moses is dead. But guess what? The story is not over, right? The narrative of God's provision continues. And so he goes on and says, because Moses is dead, now as you enter the promised land, as you go and, and acquire all of your inheritance, here's how the story is going to push forward is what God says. He says, Joshua, now you're the leader. And so we look at that and we think, well, that's a good change and a bad change. It's a bad change because they loved Moses. He was a very influential leader. He was, there was none like him, right? We back up one page to the end of Exodus, or excuse me, end of Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy 34 says there was no one, no prophet like Moses. No one had lived that could compare to Moses at that point. So he was the real deal. But in verse 8 of chapter 34, it says, And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. You hear that? How did they deal with a drastic change, a change that was sad, a change that was devastating? Well, they, they grieved for Moses, had a, a specific time of mourning, and then they continued pursuing the promises of God. They never forgot Moses. In fact, he's mentioned over 50 times in the book of Joshua, mentioned many more times in the rest of the Bible. So Moses' legacy was not gone. They never forgot what God did through Moses' life, but they had this period of mourning for him and then said, okay, the season's over. Greater things are coming. Is that how you face changes in your life? I pray that's how we can face the difficulties that we go through and the transitions. It's hard to see good seasons end, isn't it? 
Almost everyone in this room has lost something significant, or maybe a person, a period, a time, an opportunity. And rightfully so, we should have a time of mourning, maybe a time to glorify God through what he provided us with, and, and, and then say, okay, it's time to move on. We don't forget those good things. We don't forget those people. But the story of Joshua is that God's story continues. There are greater things on the horizon. And so the way the, the Israelites were called to, to change is that they were to mourn over the loss of Moses and then move on. Maybe there's a time to leave some things behind. Not only are they mourning the loss of Moses, but they're looking forward to maybe some things going away. Because what, what's going on right before Joshua begins? Well, they're wandering in the desert 40 years. Why are they wandering in the desert 40 years? Because of the disobedience and lack of faith of their forefathers. That generation is now gone, and so now they can go into the promised land. But this transition is not all sad. I mean, it's glorious in one way. They could say now we've, we've paid the penalty for our disobedience and our lack of faith. Praise be to God that God didn't forget us. Praise, praise God that he's still gracious and merciful and that his plan still stands. His promises are still true. But in one way, they're closing out a chapter of reaping the benefits or reaping the, you know, the, the punishment of their disobedience. And so maybe we're doing that today, too. We're closing out a chapter. We've closed out a year. We're heading to a new year. We're looking forward to the things God's going to do. And for a moment, let's think about how we handle change. As we, as we lose things that are valuable, let's, let's, let's view that biblically. Let's say, well, we praise God for what he provided. We mourn maybe for a period. We never forget, but we get excited about the things to come. Maybe we're like Israel in some ways, and we need to burn the boats a little bit of our past. I know I do. Speaking figuratively of an illustration from history, legend tells us that in 1519, an explorer, Hernan Cortez, led 11 ships with about 600 men headed toward Mexico. They were going to take the world's richest treasures known at that time. But there was one problem. Right? There was a strong army that had been guarding the treasure, and no one had ever defeated them, though many had tried. And so there was a famous historical statement made as they landed. Cortez commanded one thing from his troops. He said, as soon as you get off the boat, burn them. He said, burn the boats. And his men obeyed because, see, they, they only left them two choices. You either win the battle or you die trying. Now, from a spiritual standpoint, that's kind of what's going on here for Israel. They're headed to the promised land, and in a lot of ways, the call of Joshua is to remember the disobedience and the faithlessness in the desert and the things that led up to that point, and it didn't change God's graciousness or his plan, but in a lot of ways, they're headed to the promised land, and, and God tells Joshua in two chapters forward in Joshua 3, he says, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow I'm going to do a mighty thing among you, Joshua 3, 5. In a lot of ways saying, burn the boats. Because the story of, of five chapters of the Bible leading up to this point is a story of God's faithfulness and God's glory and God's plan, but it's also a story of man's doubt and his faithlessness and his disobedience time and time again. And so in a lot of ways, this new chapter that begins is, is an opportunity to say, I'm never going to reach perfection this, part, this side of heaven. What I am going to do is I begin a new season. I'm going to, I'm going to mourn the things I've lost, but I'm going to burn the boats of the things that got in the way of me pursuing the promised land. And so seasons change. May we prayerfully navigate the changes of life from a biblical perspective and see God's hand at work in the midst of what we're going through. Number two, second thing I see here is that we must be prepared. We must be prepared. You see, in John 14, 12, Jesus said that greater things are coming. That's the theme of every life, the life of every Christian, every believer. In John 14, 12, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. And so Jesus explains that the life of every believer is just this constant transition to the next great thing that God is calling us to do. And sometimes it's 40 years of wandering, 
to learn a lesson. Sometimes it's crossing the Jordan River while it's in flood stage and just trusting that God is going to provide. Sometimes it's just waking up to look over the horizon that we finally arrive at the promise that God has brought about. That's all is going to go on in the book of Joshua. But be prepared. Do you live life expecting the next great thing? We should. It doesn't mean we don't navigate difficulty. Don't hear me say that. We know that. It doesn't mean that we don't go through tough times. We do. But Jesus said, those who love me will do what I've commanded, and greater things than this will they do. <clears throat> what are you doing to prepare for the next great thing? What are you doing to prepare for the greater things that are coming? You see, our life should constantly be centered on this idea of being trained and training others. That's the call of Joshua. He had spent a long time training under Moses. And now it's his turn to take the spot in leadership and train others. And we go through those types of, of you know, cycles all of our life. We ought to have others that are pouring into us. And I pray that you have people that are significant in your life, that are teaching you the word of God, that are helping you, that are discipling you. And I pray you're doing that for others. I pray that you're intentionally equipping others, helping others prepare for the greater things that are coming. Because Jesus said, greater things than these will you do. And so it's a beautiful opportunity in the book of Joshua to see the discipleship model unfold, to see what it looks like to prepare for the things that are coming. Take a look at what Joshua has been doing up to this point. Just a quick recap of his life. He was born as a slave when the people of God were enslaved in Egypt. Joshua was born into the world as, a, as the firstborn of his family. You know what that means, right? A little bit of study of the, the Israelites being enslaved in Egypt. We know there was once a command given for all the firstborn to be taken. And so that means Joshua's life would have been in danger as a young child. He would have been the recipient of the Passover where God spared all of the firstborn of his people. And so Joshua would have grown up as a, as a slave, as a servant, who would have seen Moses as, as the great leader, would have watched him as, as Moses led the people across the Red Sea as God parted it. Joshua began as a, as a slave, as a servant. Those formative years would have been pivotal in him understanding who God is and how God provides and what man's response to that is, faith and obedience. Joshua also would have learned as a soldier. We were told shortly after God rescued his people from Egypt, about two months later, the Amalekites come to attack them. And guess where Joshua's at while the Amalekites are attacking the people of God? He's in the front lines as a soldier, as a leader, enduring incredible difficulty, but doing it with faith and obedience and learning every step of the way about the character and nature of God, about the promises of God, about faithfulness and obedience. And then Joshua would have had an opportunity to be a spy. We're told that as the people of God are reaching the promised land and still on the borders, Moses sends some spies over to look in at Canaan and see what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. Joshua and Caleb were the only two that came back with faith. The rest of them came back in disbelief, looking at it from man's perspective with fear and doubt. Joshua and Caleb came back trusting God. And then Moses had a special tent that he set up outside the camp where he met with God. And guess who was picked to guard that tent? Joshua. Think of the beautiful moments Joshua would have seen Moses spending time with the Lord. Hearing from God. And just think of what he would have learned. Look at your life. The things you've navigated. The good times you've had. The difficulties you've encountered. All those that have poured into you. All the times God has showed his presence in various ways. Celebrate that today. But also know that all of that is part of the preparation. All of that is the journey of faith that equips you for the greater things that are to come. We must be prepared. We must live a life knowing that around every corner, under our, on every horizon, God is doing mighty things. And yes, there may be periods where it's tough, 
I mean, think of Joshua spent 40 years in the desert knowing and believing and trusting that God was taking them to the promised land. Fully convinced that greater things were coming, but 40 years he labored in the desert. What have you been waiting on for 40 years? Is there anything? I mean, probably something. Is there one specific thing you've waited on 40 years? I mean, a lot of us haven't been alive 40 years yet. But no matter where we're at in life, what stage we're in, how old we are, the truth is still the same. Joshua faithfully waited however long it was going to take because he believed in the promises of God. He believed there were greater things to come. And so the only response to that is one of faith and obedience. Is that the same that's true for us today? Are we in the period, even if we're having to wait, even if we only see glimmers and glimpses of what's to come, are we living in the desert, faithfully awaiting the promised land? Maybe God has, seen, has given you bigger glimpses of the promised land. Maybe God has provided this year for you in so many wonderful ways that this has been a good year. Maybe it's been a time that, that, that you're much further along in your faith journey now than you were this time last year. Either way, wherever we're at, whether we're kind of sitting on hold in the desert or whether God is just bringing one opportunity after another in your life to show you his goodness. Either way, we must always intentionally and passionately be preparing for the next step of obedience that God calls us to. There are greater things to come. And so that brings us to point three. Well, how do we get ready? How do we prepare? Well, Joshua said it very simply. He said, know the way. He said, God is going to be with you no matter where you're at and what you're doing. The Lord said he will never leave us nor forsake us. But here's what God's specific instructions were. <clears throat> he said, only be strong and courageous. Be careful to do all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Listen, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do all that is according to what is written so that your way may be prosperous. You know what we see through Joshua, really through the first six books of the Bible? We see that every time God's word is taken seriously, the people prosper. Every time his word is held to with passion and determination, there is good success. But we see that every time that the people doubt and get selfish and drift to the left or the right, there's punishment, there is difficulty, there is delay, there is frustration. And so it's important that God make it clear to Joshua that, hey, you just spent 40 years in the desert. Let me tell you what, we're headed forward. Our promises have not changed, what the Lord says, but as you head to the promised land, there's no more of this drifting to the left and the right. There's no more doing it your way. There's no more taking matters into your own hands. You must know the way to be prepared for what is coming, and there's only one way. It's through faithful obedience to the word of the Lord. That's always the only answer. It's not by our efforts. Not by our goodness. Joshua was not a great leader because he was a good person. He was a great leader because he obeyed the word of the Lord. Same is true of us. There's only one way. No matter what you're talking about, it's never by our efforts or our selfish desires. It's always by obedience to the word of the Lord. That's the story of Joshua. Number four, the fourth thing and final that I see this morning before we take a break and come back next week is that we are called to run our race. It's a beautiful concept. Joshua begins, the book of Joshua begins with the obituary of Moses. The last chapter of Deuteronomy celebrates Moses' life encapsulates Moses' command, his final charge to the people, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful part of every funeral, right, where you get to talk about what the person did and how God worked in their life. They were a believer, their response. The book of Joshua is going to end with another obituary. It's going to be that of Joshua. It's going to be a, a celebration of what God did through his life. But in the, those are the two bookends, two obituaries. In the middle is this beautiful race being run, this beautiful journey being experienced, and that's the, the call of all of us that know Jesus is, is run your race. Paul said this. He said, run the race that's marked out for you. God's prepared the way. He's given us the promise of the promised land, of the things to come, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, that more beautiful things are always on the horizon. What are we doing with that? What is our response to that? Are we running our race. Friends, let me tell you this morning, you are never more alive than you were when you were faithfully doing what God has called you to do. 
You're never more passionate, more joyful, more energetic. You're never experiencing more victory or success or fulfillment than when you are just faithfully following what God has called you to do. It's the story of Joshua. Just think about how victorious and miraculous it was when God led the people across the Red Sea, provided for them for their every need miraculously day after day, and yet time after time they doubted and they complained and they disobeyed. And now in Joshua, it's kind of a, kind of a, a, a restirring of their passion where God says, I'm going to provide. I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to be with you. But your part is very simple but it's very much required. It's to follow in faith and obedience. It's to run your race. A theme I've learned to live by is just to have one goal in life. And that one goal, listen, write it down, is to take the next faithful step of obedience. That's all we are to do. Our entire life is to take the next faithful step of obedience. That's all we can do. That's all we're called to do. That's all we should do. That's the secret to life. Over the course of the journey of Joshua's life, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful journey. It's a race. And we can learn so much from it. Same is true of every believer in Jesus. Your life is a beautiful race, a journey. God is calling you heavenward, but sometimes we get lost in the busyness or the stress or our own selfish desires and a long list of other things. But today, would this year, this new start, this new chapter, this new season be a time to just recommit to one thing? That's to take the next faithful step of obedience, one after another after another. Friends, if we can do that, we will never run out of opportunities to be faithful and obedient to the Lord. You believe that this morning? I mean, God has promised us so much, and he's given us the proof that his promises always stand, and that's what we're going to celebrate through the study of the book of Joshua. And you're never more alive when you're walking in faithful and obedience to God's word. That's the only way to live. So what we see today is that when we keep the main thing the main thing, when we believe that, hey, seasons change, if they were good, we're going to celebrate them and mourn over them. If they were bad, we're going to praise the Lord that they've come to an end. Right? We're going to be prepared for the next, I'm just going to live life believing that God is constantly up to something and that Jesus said there were greater things to come. And so I'm going to spend my whole existence preparing for the next step of obedience, whether it's studying God's word, being faithful in prayer, living out what God is calling me to do each day, saying no to the temptations and the things that would draw me astray, refusing to go to the left or to the right, but to stay the path of faithful obedience, knowing that there are greater things to come, that God has promised, that he is providing, that he will guide the path if I will just take the next faithful step of obedience. What a beautiful race it is. There's no other way to live. There's, lot, there's lots more to say about Joshua. So we're going to close for that today. Would you read the book of Joshua this week? You can read it in one evening, one setting. Many of you have read it multiple times, I know. But read it this year with this, this fresh atmosphere, this fresh eyes looking at it saying, God is up to something. There's chapters ending, there's new things beginning. He is faithful. My only response to what he has done is to live a life of faith and obedience and expect the good things to come. Let's bow before him. Lord, we praise you for this time just to come celebrate who you are and what you've done. God, I thank you for your holy word. I thank you for the story it tells. But more than that, I thank you for what it reveals about you your grace, your mercy, your love, your power, your provision, your eternal plan, your promises that always are fulfilled. And God, today I thank you for the story of Joshua, a story of faith and obedience, a story of, of really just our response to you. God, I pray for every person who's been a part of this, everyone who will watch this later. I just pray that you would move in every heart and every life just to reveal your promises to us specifically, individually, personally. God, I pray for those that are going through changes. Seasons that have ended, chapters that have closed, new things that have begun. Would you provide grace and mercy where it's needed? But ultimately, would you give us all just a, a renewed level of excitement and passion about the things that you're doing and the things that are yet to come? 
God, that we would be prepared, that we would constantly, intentionally just seek you with our whole heart so that we'll be in a place to respond with faith and obedience to who you are and what you're doing every moment of our lives. God, would you help us run our race, that you would be glorified through it, that your will would be accomplished. God, that our time here would be centered on what you've called us to do. Thank you for each person here. I pray you bless every heart in life as we enter a time of response. God, just lay my heart before you during this time and just pray you work, move, and act to teach me and help me and equip me to face this week. My prayer is the same for each person in this room. God, would you just move in a mighty way to do the work that only you can do, just to show your promises and to provide what's necessary so that we could respond with faith and obedience. Thank you, God. We love you and praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, will you stand with us this morning? We'll have a time of response and just an invitation. As we've studied God's word, the power of his spirit, we believe that we trust God. He's always doing something. There's always something for us to respond to with faith and obedience. And so would you open your heart before the Lord today?